Okay, so this is Unit 9 talking about gases, and this fir first podcast is just really talking about the basics of gases. We're going to be filling in page 2, which really is just a bunch of definitions for us to write down to understand our gases a little better. So, getting started, the first most important thing about gases is this kinetic molecular theory. Sometimes we abbreviate that KMT, and these are just the rules for gases, the rules they have to follow in order for us to be able to predict their behavior. So this is the basis of everything we're going to do this unit, is we have to know and assume that this, it, these rules are going to be followed. And the first rule for gases is that they have to be extremely small particles. Well, everything is made of extremely small particles called atoms. But the key with gases is that they have to have large distances between them. So teeny tiny little particles with lots of big spaces in between them. Now, when those gases are moving around, those tiny particles, they have what's called elastic collisions. Sometimes they run into each other, but those elastic collisions mean that no energy is lost or gained during those collisions. They might transfer that energy from one particle to another. Uh, imagine ping pong balls. You might have one that's moving slowly, and if a fast one comes and hits it, then that slow moving particle might move a little faster. But then that fast moving particle is going to be moving a little slower. So, the same total energy between any particles when they collide. Uh, as opposed to, like, chunks of Play-Doh, if you throw Play-Doh at each other, they might stick together and they might just stop moving altogether. And that can't happen with our gas particles. So, they have elastic collisions. They bounce off each other perfectly. Third rule for gases is that they are in constant random straight line motion. So gases never slow down. This is the big difference between our gases and our liquids and solids is because they are just moving so constantly in every single direction. Uh, solid particles are barely moving at all. They just sit in the same place and vibrate. Liquid molecules can flow and move around each other, but not as much as gases. And then that straight line motion part uh, is kind of has uh, is related to what we're putting in number four and the fact that there's no attraction between these gas molecules. That means that they're going to keep moving in a straight line. They're not going to veer towards any other particles or away from them. They just bounce off each other and go the opposite direction until they hit something else. And the last rule is that the average kinetic energy, the speed of these gas molecules, depends on the temperature that that gas is at. You might have heard the term heat them up, speed them up, and it's just the hotter something is, the faster those molecules are moving, and vice versa. So those are our basic rules for gases. And then we have a few terms that also apply to gases. These aren't rules, but these are just some properties of gases that we need you to understand. And most of them you've probably heard before. I saved that number five for the next slide because those are a little bit different. But expansion, expanding, means that gases can expand and fill any container. So even if I have a, um, I don't know, a bottle of perfume and spray that gas in a small area, it can expand to fill up, that smell can fill up the entire room. So they can expand. Fluidity is like a fluid. Gases can flow just like liquids. Liquids and gases are both fluids. Uh, it's just that normally we don't see the gases flowing because most of the time they are invisible. Gases also have very low density. Um, if you remember that density equation, density is equal to mass over volume. Well, if we have a really, really tiny mass and a really, really big volume, both of those things together and separately are going to cause this density to decrease. So gases have a low density for those basic reasons. And then compressibility. Compressing something is kind of the opposite of expanding. And gas particles can be squeezed closer together into a smaller volume. So if you have a helium container, those an average helium container can fill 40 to 50 balloons. But there's no way that you'd be able to fit 40 or 50 balloons in the same box that that helium container came in. It's because those gases, that helium, has been compressed and squeezed into that canister. And the particles themselves haven't gotten any smaller or bigger. It's just that they've taken up, they take up less space, so there's less space in between those atoms and molecules. 
Now, these are the two words that are probably new to you, and it, what's really important is that we know the difference between them. So diffusion, diffusion, is gases spreading out from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And all that means is kind of back to the perfume bottle example. If I spray a little bit of perfume, it's going to spread out from the area where it's of highest concentration, where there's the most of it, where I first sprayed it, into the rest of the room where there's none, and it's going to keep spreading out until it's perfectly distributed and even and all the way through the room. Effusion, on the other hand, is gases escaping through a small hole or opening. So the way that I tell the difference between these is effusion is gases escaping. And even if they don't use the word escape, if they're going through a small opening, then they're kind of crawling out. They're escaping from jail. So that's effusion through that small opening. Defusion, there's no barrier. There's no small opening. It's just you release it and that diffusion is the difference between that high and low concentration. So they're going to move if there is a difference in concentrations. So those are those two words. For both of them, faster particles uh, are going, the faster diffusion, faster effusion is going to happen when my particles are smaller. So you know, it's easier for you to squeeze through those small openings and it's going to effuse faster if the particles themselves are smaller. Now, a uh, perfume bottle really is the perfect example for each of these. Um, and you can see each of them happening. When you first spray the perfume, then the gas escapes through that small hole, and that's going to be effusion. But after you initially spray it into this small area, it's going to start to spread out and diffuse into the rest of the room. So that has both things happening. Now, ideal gases is really what we're studying here. These are the perfect gases that follow all of the rules that we set up at the top of the page. And these are going to be the gases that we focus on. And we're going to pretend, honestly, that all gases are ideal gases. Um, the most ideal gases are going to be noble gases, diatomics, and anything else that's nonpolar covalent. Those are going to be the ones that don't have any attraction for the other molecules in the air. But the rest of the gases are real gases, and those are gases that don't follow all of the rules, but they can act ideal under certain conditions. Now, what conditions do you ask? Maybe you just saw it pop up a moment ago, um, but the conditions where the gases act the most ideal is the same as when you are the most ideal student over the summer. You know when there's no pressure on you, you can... Just think about the next year and plan things out. I mean, like, I'm going to do all my homework. I'm going to study for all of my tests. And in the summer, with that low-pressure atmosphere, when it's the hottest, you're the most ideal student. Same situation for our gases. With low pressure and high temperatures, this limits the attraction between those gas particles. And even real gases can start to act like ideal gases under those circumstances. So those are all of our definitions. We're real quick just going to fill in those graphs at the bottom of the page and start to explore some of the ideas between pressure, volume, and temperature and how they change together. And so with this, pressure versus volume were some experiences, experiments that Boyle, um, I don't remember what his first name is. You don't really need to know these names, um, but they're experiments that certain people did, and they got named after them. So this Boyle guy was experimenting with the pressure and volume of our gases. And what he observed, it's kind of like if you have a squishy Nerf bar ball or something. As he increased the pressure on a gas, the volume of that gas decreased. So imagine squishing that ball between your hands. The more pressure you apply to the ball, then the less volume it has, the smaller it gets. And then you release that pressure, and the volume gets bigger. So he came up with a graph that looked like this and decided that it is an inverse relationship. Don't worry, we'll put numbers to these later. Just right now, we're just making sure that we know that these go opposite directions, and that's what we call an inverse relationship. Now, Mr. Gay-Lussex uh, was studying how pressure and temperature changed, 
And when they looked at it, this was a direct relationship. As they increased pressure, those particles were hitting each other more and harder, and that little bit of friction between each of those collisions in that gas caused the temperature to go up. And as they decreased the pressure, the temperature went down. So this is a direct relationship. And then volume versus temperature. Uh, this was Charles's law. He also saw that that was a direct relationship. As you increase the temperature of something, you heat it up, then the volume is going to expand because those molecules are moving faster. Like we said, the kinetic energy is based on temperature. So they're moving faster. They're going to have to spread out, cool them down. They're not going to take up as much space. They're going to come together a little bit. That's a direct relationship. So we're going to explore this more in class next time and try and make sure that we can read a problem and determine what is changing here and what's being held constant. So that's it.